Christian church, Christmas is not a single day celebration, but a season. How many days are there of Christmas? Twelve. Like the Christmas carol. Twelve days of Christmas. The twelve day celebration. Not, not just a single day of them. But no one has given Walmart the minimum. Uh, I was in a, a Walmart on December 26th and uh, went through the car dial and uh, by my count, they're, they're getting ready for a different holiday, Valentine's Day. And uh, they would have, they had section after section of cards. Uh, there were seven across and 13 down and five sections just like that. So by my count, there were 450 different choices for sending in words the news of your love to someone. There really is no shortage of words to tell somebody that you love them. And yet merely hearing those words or reading them in a card, while good, is not good enough. It doesn't satisfy the deepest needs and longings of the human heart. And at Christmas, we see what God does when God wants to send His very best. He sends his son. E. Stanley Jones, the great evangelist, uh, he pointed out that one of the things that makes Christianity different than any of the other religions of the world is that it's not at its heart about us being like God. It's about when God came to be like us. It's the opposite. God, God became one of us. And this belief is why Christians refer to as the Incarnation. Our conviction that Jesus Christ was with us, that He was fully human as well as fully divine. And so what would prompt God to enter the fray, to come into our world in this new and decisive way through the person of Jesus? What, was, what possible motivation could God have? Well, John 3.16 and 17 says this, for God so loved the world. God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son that whosoever should believe in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world in order to condemn the world, but so that through, the, through Him the world might be saved. Love. Love is the key to why God sent Jesus, His love in the flesh. And in my reading of Scripture, Scriptures like the ones we've heard today in Colossians 3 and 1 John 4, love is the defining characteristic of God. Therefore, the best Christian theology, like the best Christian evangelism, like the best Christian mission, like the best Christian anything, begins and ends and is totally filled and motivated by love. You could start with something else as the foundation of your theology. John Calvin was one of the great reformists of the church. He was very smart, very important, and he made invaluable contributions to Christian thought. But he started his theology somewhere else, somewhere other than with God's love. And that was with God's power, his sovereignty, his ability to do what God pleased. Now, not only was Calvin a theologian, but he was also a pastor. And he made the observation about how often it was that sometimes the people who had everything going for them, who seemed to have every advantage, were not people who came to a mature, robust Christian faith. And how often it was that the people who didn't seem to have anything, uh, nothing seemed to be going right in their lives, well, they, they had some of the deepest faith. And so Calvin, as he wrestled with this and he thought about why that was, he just chalked up salvation, like everything else, to the, that he believed, to the will of God. According, uh, th this doctrine is, is called predestination. And according to this doctrine, God, being infinite in wisdom and in power, decides who's saved and who isn't. And moreover, he made that decision about us before we were born before time even began. Now, predestination wasn't the centerpiece of Calvin's theology. He wrote two huge honking books. I don't know if you've had to read them, Dusty. 
of theology, and it's, it's sort of buried towards the back of the sack. This wasn't something that he thought was the most important thing to know about God, but just his observation, his speculation about how it is that some would be saved and some would not. But for some of the people who came after Calvin, they devoted their lives and everything about themselves to defending predestination, even expanding it. And one of the things that the people who came after Calvin argued for was limited atonement. According to this belief, Jesus didn't die for the sins of everyone, but only for those who God had already chosen to save. And so not one drop of Jesus' precious blood, according to this view, was spilled on behalf of those who would not, who could not receive it. And this is what a theology that begins and ends with God's sovereignty looks like. If you take it to its logical furthermost conclusion, one of the first people who raised objections to predestination was a man by the name of Jacob Arminius. And then a while later, there was an Anglican priest by the name of John Wesley, who uh, followed Arminius' thought. And he also rejected predestination. Wesley pointed out that whatever sense predestination makes of some biblical passages, there are many others that it contradicts it, that makes them unintelligible. If predestination was true, Wesley said, then it made Jesus a liar. Because Jesus' mouth was full of gracious words for sinners, words of invitation, words of peace, words of forgiveness. And if Jesus had intended those words only for some, or had not meant them, as he said, then Jesus isn't who we thought he was. If predestination was true, Wesley thought, it also reflected poorly on the character of God the Father. Because choosing some people to save with others to damn, while giving them the illusion of free will, contradicted what Wesley thought was the defining characteristic of God, which is love. Unless you think this, uh, this uh, sort of Calvinism, this belief in God's sovereignty above all, is just a, a historical phenomenon that's just part of the past, let me assure you that it's alive and well, and expresses itself in this way. <clears throat> Have you ever heard anyone say that everything happens for a reason? The meaning of faith, for, for some Christians, is certainty, absolute certainty, that everything bad, from your stub toe to the Holocaust, was part of, orchestrated by God as part of some master plan. Now, I do believe that God is, is all-powerful. But if it comes into conflict, I believe in God's love. So I don't, if someone argues for me that something that happens, something bad that happens is part of God's will, I don't necessarily argue it with them right then and there. I don't duke it out with them. But in my heart, I think there's another way to believe. That this is not the take it or lose it proposition of the Christian faith. I'm with, uh, I'm with Susan Hawkins, who uh, sent me and Randy an email with some of the details of, of little baby Eli's death. And to her message, she added this. God doesn't do bad things. He helps us get through bad things. And I say, I'm in, I'm in with that. See, theology, what we believe about God, is not just an abstract set of principles that are set out and argued by clergy types. What each of us believes about God has a tremendous impact on how we live our lives. Back in the 18th century, once this, once this idea of predestination had taken hold, religious people were left with a lot of uncertainty. Because you could never know if you were among the elect or not whether you were eternally saved or damned. So over time, people began to presume that those that God was going to bless in the life to come would also be blessed in this life with material possessions, with luck, with a healthy family, with all those things. 
And so acquiring wealth and success became the greatest good, no matter the cost. It served almost as a, as a measure of proof of your salvation. And can't you see how far this was removed from Calvin's original intent? Because he said you couldn't tell about people just looking at them, who would respond to the gospel and who wouldn't. And yet that's exactly, a couple centuries later, what people believe. So, if you were a business person, you tried to make as much money as possible at any cost, without regard for the people who work for you. This is the, uh, this is the origin of what's called the Protestant work ethic. And it's the dark side of it, too. Because for some, it didn't matter if the person working in your mind was safe, or making a living wage, or working less than 16 hours a day, or if that person was even an adult. Because to you it seemed that they weren't loved by God, and therefore they were getting what they deserved. Uh, Bobby McLean, who was one of my seminary professors, he pointed out that, that every sort of ism, racism, sexism, classism, has at its root the notion that some people are not worthy of love. That they're not worthy of God's love, that they're not deserving of our love and common decency. And so, how did John Wesley respond to the prevailing Calvinism of his day? Well, Wesley insisted that if God really is love, then God's love must extend to everyone. Imagine, if you will, the chance of this part up here on the stage as the circle of those who are within God's love and the sanctuary as the people who are outside of it. Well, predestination says that some people are up here and some people are down here. You can never know which one you are and you can't change them. It doesn't sound like good news. Now, a more Baptist understanding is that we're all out here. Uh, that we all are, the image of God in which we were created is so helplessly marred and, and disrupted and dirtied up that we can't be loved by God until we have repented. But John Wesley said, we start up here. Now, he had more in common with the Baptists than, than with the Calvinists. Because he thought that, that everybody did need to repent. That everybody did need to turn from their sin and to receive the grace that comes from Jesus Christ. To atone for the mistakes they made. And yet, he believed that there was nobody. Nobody who was unloved by God just by the nature of who they are. And that there was nobody who was unloved by God, even by virtue of the terrible things they had done. That no one was beyond the reach of God to save if they would only receive the grace that came from Him. Now Wesley was, did not believe in universal salvation. He didn't believe that everybody would respond to that grace. But he believed that that, that grace was pulling us all inward was trying to get us up on the stage. Just trying to get us within that circle. And he believed that we could help people along. That we could help bring them into a relationship, a closer relationship with God, a saving relationship with God. And that that invitation was extended to everybody, no matter who they are and what they've done. The word for that is provenient grace. Provenient grace is the love of God that becomes it before we ever know about it, before we know the first thing to accept. It's extended to every person that's ever lived in every place around the world. It doesn't exclude anyone on the basis of an eternal decree, and it doesn't give up on anyone. Because for God, there are no lost causes. There are no irredeemable sinners. And according to this Wesleyan understanding, Christ died for the everyone's sake. If some would not accept that grace for themselves, it didn't mean that Christ's sacrifice for them was in vain, because no act of love is ever wasted. So against his personal inclinations as, as kind of 
kind of an uptight Anglican priest, John Wesley preached the good news of God's love in the fields and on the streets to people who had forgotten God's love, if they had ever suspected it at all. He drove that message of love home with the force of his example as he ministered to prisoners and the sick and widows and the orphans and the poor. And it was love for all and not just for some that motivated Wesley to rail against the slave trade. In fact, the last thing he did was send a letter to his friend William Wilberforce, uh, the, key, the key figure behind the abolition of slavery in England. And so love is why we continue in tireless ministry to the last, the least, and the lost. Everything Jesus Christ did began and ended with love. Jesus came into the world that first Christmas out of love. His ministry was one that was motivated by love. He went to the cross for the sake of love. And he was the Well, that proves that God's love is even stronger than death. When you leave this place, do so resolve to tell and show God's love to the world doing all in your power to kick down the gates of hell. After all, as Methodists, we don't believe that God wants to send anyone there.